Hello there, it's Volsker and D Square Talk uh, here on the House of D channel. Uh, happy Labor Day weekend, everybody. Hope you have a uh, fun and safe weekend. Volsker, how's everything going with you? Ah, it's going pretty well. Uh, waiting for the nice little three day weekend. Get away from work for a little bit and uh, mm. hopefully get to dive into some more comics this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. I want to check out this Marvel Comics 1000 a little bit more. I've looked at it a little bit, though. Lots of really cool tidbits in there. And um, I actually have uh, an Avengers uh, trade with the first five issues when they kind of rebooted it. That's probably about a year ago or so. And, uh, yeah, I've really only made it for the first couple of issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty cool because whatever whatever villain is in there is seriously dropping celestials like they're nothing it's like this big other ultimate celestial and you know the avenger and it also shows you how like the avengers existed like you know before the dinosaurs in in a form that's cool we'll get we we'll make it into it oh, that's interesting yeah yeah it's pretty it's a pretty interesting concept like you know like uh it, odin is kind of the thor you know so odin is part of it and you know how Doctor Strange has the amulet of Agamotto. Well, actual Agamotto was there, uh, like a, a real primitive Black Panther, Star Brand. It was, it was, yeah, it was really cool how they tied it in. Yeah. Um, but what we have been uh, digesting lately is, of course, the uh, Hox Pox House of X Powers of X stuff, and of course, the latest one was uh, House of X issue number three. And we've also been uh, both reading together the Absolute Carnage. And you've been diving a little bit more into that than me. You've got some of the offshoot issues. Mm -hmm. So we'll be looking forward to that insight uh, when we talk about that. But first we want to get into uh, House of X3 here. Um, you know, it's obviously a great, it's a quality issue. Uh, we see... A really good uh, cliffhanger, but you know, just nothing. You know, no, no, like jaw-dropping revelations, and that's going to happen. That's to be expected. Um, so, but you know, definitely, this is just not one of the issues that generated a whole lot of mm -hmm. a lot of buzz. I don't think uh, in in terms of like any major re uh, revelation or anything like that, I don't think they were up in your face, but mm -hmm. we've kind of talked a little about it too. Um, you know, I think it, they definitely all but confirmed one of our theories that we've been talking mm -hmm. about. Um, but in terms of like the previous, yeah, it wasn't just up in your face, like just dropping shit like crazy. Um, I would still definitely call it a much better issue than uh, a couple weeks ago with all the sci-fi mumbo jumbo this actually led the story in the direction that we're expecting or into the next step so we know kind of what to expect yeah uh definitely a, a good setup you know we've kind of it seems like okay the world is built mm -hmm. you know certainly there's going to be things that dropped and i have some major questions that you know mm -hmm. we'll talk about you know i've got like two to three okay you know here's kind of the outstanding stuff uh, that, you know, I don't understand, uh, out, um, just unresolved. So, mm -hmm. uh, so in, in the tradition of the other house of X, you know, this is concentrating on that original, you know, storyline that started in house of X one mm -hmm. with the, uh, mutants trying to gain sovereignty over, you know, the humans. Yep. So we start with kind of, so obviously we learned in the past issues that, because of what Moira did, and they they have come up with a fact that if a mother mold comes online, then it is it leads to Nimrod. Yes. And they've learned, thanks to Sabretooth, Toad, and Mystique, and we'll talk about Sabretooth here in a moment, uh, thanks to them, they know about this mother mold uh, that Orchis has orbiting around the sun. And mm -hmm. they need to send someone there to destroy it. So this issue starts with them, you know, forming that team, you know, kind of a, a pep talk and, you know, Scott Summers going over the fact that they're not even going to take like any Krokoa seeds to teleport back. The reason why they're not going to do that is because they 
can't risk the humans getting a hold of it and studying it and understanding it. So, you know, whoever goes on this know that they're probably not coming back. The mm-hmm. team he chooses is Wolverine, Husk, Archangel, Monet, uh, Marvel Girl, Jean Grey, mm-hmm. Nightcrawler, and Mystique. Yep. And it just, it's, you know, some really good awe inspiring leadership from Cyclops here. You know, Charles Xavier is praising him and they're saying, you're, you're never going to be forgotten. You know, just, you know, preparing him really almost to die, but, you know, making sure he understands this is, you know, martyr status uh, at this point. Yeah. And it kind of picks right up from uh, the last issue, too, where mm-hmm. he was just like, does it need to be done? Well, then it's done. And it mm-hmm. literally picks up with him finishing that sentence. And then they almost kind of came off, too, that there were, uh, was it... Um, Magneto and Xavier were almost, in essence, also preaching. Yeah. Like, I was just kind of weird. Like, whoa, there's mutants actually, like, preaching him up and not just saying, hey, you know, what you're doing is important. You probably will die, but by the way, you won't forget. Like, Magneto's scripts just almost, like, straight out of a Bible, kind of like. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely some uh, symbolism there and, you know, just the bravery that Cyclops is, you know, showing here mm-hmm. is, I mean, that, that is Cyclops. This really is kind of cool. You know, Scott Summers has always been that, that stalwart believer of the dream, you know, following mm-hmm. Xavier to a T and we've learned throughout the years that Xavier wasn't exactly worthy of a, such a great characters like Cyclops, um, you know, carrying out his his every whim and that kind of and and that kind of leads me to one of my thoughts about uh, the fact that we don't see a lot of xavier when they showed the the dawn of x books Mm -hmm. uh but we certainly do see a lot of cyclops here and as i mentioned xavier over the years has kind of proven himself to you know not be someone you particularly trust not somebody that's always had you know others best interest and manipulative mm-hmm. so he's kind of fallen from grace uh yet cyclops i mean he had a rough patch there with the inhumans vs x-men avengers vs x-men like he was pretty radical on the mutant side but um either way my theory here is we're really going to see this torch pass and i'm i'm going to think of this moment you know think of how stalwart in in a belief in Xavier that Cyclops is here, but maybe later we're going to see where he's going to, Xavier's going to cross some sort of line and, and Cyclops is, is going to have to take over. But then that leads me to my next real big kind of mystery thought here, which is what we still don't know what's up with the fact that these X-Men were born, you know, like the Urukai from Lord of the Rings. So what's that yeah. all about, though? You know, how, are these going to be the characters that carry us on into the next uh, books? Uh, you know, who knows? Um, but nonetheless, uh, the, you know, the troops are rallied. They get into this uh, Shi'ar uh, ship that they have, and they launch straight at the Mother Mold. Mm-hmm. Um, then we get some, you know, more graphs here. You know, there's one labeled machines, and it goes through kind of the progression Sentinel, Master Mold, Mother Mold, Omega Sentinel, and Nimrod, and we're all familiar with that. Uh, Then we get kind of another timeline here um, that kind of explains the Sleeping Giant, which is the program that uh, Moira and Charles Xavier kind of came up with to kind of monitor, right, to kind of look for Nimrod technological thresholds, they call it, but basically, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever, just, you know, Anything that you think is going to lead to a Nimrod, let us know. And obviously that that happens. And that's why they acquire the Soul's Hammer again. Mm -hmm. uh, again. So, yeah, pretty cool there. Then we cut to uh, the next scene. And this is pretty much what everybody... I mean, if one thing that has got people kind of abuzz about this issue, it would be this scene right here. And that's Sabretooth on trial. Yeah. Um, this is really cool on a particular level because me growing up, 
80s, 90s, Sabretooth was a stone cold killer, stone cold bad guy. Mm -hmm. Then the 90s happened and the Age of Apocalypse saw him as a good guy and people kind of like that. And you see that again in the Exile series, um, which is a series you should maybe look into. Um, we could talk about that another time. Anyway, Stone Cold Killer. But then, um, I don't know if you remember when I mentioned the Red Skull having Xavier's brain and becomes Red Onslaught. And it's his whole, uh, so he's the big baddie to the Axis yeah. storyline. Okay. So one thing that happened in there is called the Inversion, where like... Good guys became bad guys. Bad guys became good. And then shit happened to where, like, it all got inverted back. But some people were in a particular circumstance where they didn't get inverted back. And one of those was Sabretooth. He was inverted into a good guy, and he didn't get reverted back to a bad guy. So he's kind of been a, a, a good guy, but losing his way a little bit, kind of naturally reverting back. And we see here, in, in all his glory... Uh, Sabretooth, uh, Ruthless uh, Maniac Killer um, with uh, a healing factor, of course. Either way, um, Emma Frost comes in, and this is what everyone's loving. She, you know, full pimp mode, full Emma <laughs> Frost. You know, I own this shit. Uh, has a real cool scene because basically it looks like the nations of the world accepted the mutants uh, sovereignty because she comes in and it's like yeah he's a bad motherfucker and you know and he's taunting everybody while this is happening but she's like yeah he's coming with us though he does enjoy diplomatic immunity um, and there's uh, obviously people in the room don't agree with that and this one woman in the room that's you know kind of a, a bailiff or whatever I don't even call her but she draws a gun on Emma and yeah Emma's just like Listen, I could make you, you know, shove that gun up your ass, but instead <laughs> you're just going to pretend like, you know, you could have stopped me, but you let me go and, you know, whatever. And just walks out with Sabretooth. Um, <laughs> and I'll pretend there was actually a chance. <laughs> yeah, you can pretend there was actually a chance that you would stop me from, from doing what we're doing. And then the, the, the next scene we see here is the assault, uh, the X-Men assault. And this is really cool. This is in really great X-Men fashion because basically as soon as the humans discover, like, the, the X-Men are there, they're like, mm -hmm. we're fucked. Like, we're fucked. There's nothing they can do. Well, maybe we can, you know, maybe they don't know this. Oh, shit, they know that. Yeah, they're going to land right there and come into the... Yeah. You know, the X-Men, smartly, they take... Like I mentioned, they took Nightcrawler. So as they're approaching uh, the the ma uh, Mother Mold, they send Nightcrawler into teleport so he can scout. They've got the schematics. They've got all this information about this shit. So they are basically... They can't be stopped at this point. They know this. They're not ready for the X-Men. The X-Men have caught them off guard. The X-Men know everything they need to know about the station. They know where to mm -hmm. enter the station. So they're fucked. Um, except for, uh, you know, they introduce this soldier guy. He's obviously close with whoever's working with the Omega Sentinel here. I can't remember her name. It's really not particularly important to me. Um, so, But he's right there where the X-Men are going to come in. Mm -hmm. And he rigs his gun real quick to explode. And then, yeah, there's this big explosion. The ship that the X-Men came in is, uh, gone. is gone. And so, yeah, leaves us at a, at a bit of a cliffhanger there as far as what happened with mm -hmm. the X-Men. I'm sure they survived. Uh, but we are, at the very least, there now in the station with officially no way home. Yeah. Um. But they did throw kind of key, a couple key points to kind of branch off that, too. Mm -hmm. I just love the fact that they're like, oh, they literally picked the best spot that you could ever on this entire ship mm -hmm. to enter. <laughs> Nobody can do anything. Um, but they also kind of alluded that they're kind of doing it in fashion that they're not trying to damage the ship. Mm -hmm. Which I wonder if maybe they're trying to actually use it and maybe find a way to put that technology on the mutant side instead of the humans. Interesting. 
Well, that would that would definitely be ironic if the mutants were able to use the machines against the humans, so that it's the uh, mutants and machines, mm-hmm. which uh, you know go into the future instead of the humans and machines. And that is interesting because if we think about the ascension mm-hmm. period, the ascension you know timeline, let's not forget, you know where the phalanx is coming in and all that, you know. It definitely looked like, you know, it looked like the mutants had, you know, kind of merged with the machine and, and not the humans. Yeah. And then, of course, they had those, you know, mutants in a cage basically there. So, yeah, that that is definitely interesting. Um, that, huh, interesting thought. Um, you know, definitely comment on that. What do you think? Are the mutants and the machines going to uh, be the ones that merge and therefore victorious? I mean, it would definitely be a different ending or at least a different future than we're used to so yeah. far with all the, uh, the, uh, lives. Um, and then it, I did also like how it kind of talked a little bit about the, uh, the transformation because we talked about this last week with one of the issues and was the powers of X where the baby was being transformed and half machine. Mm-hmm. It kind of, some of the, the charts and stuff, it actually talked a little bit about that transformation right. in this. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool and it's kind of tying it back, but it brings me to that theory I mentioned, because if you look at the two where we're sitting at two issues, we have, Powers of X, um, we had Apocalypse, his team, give the uh, Nimrod boot up Codex to Myra, kill her, and send her back. And now we're playing out in Powers of, um, or House of Ten, that now they knew where to get this information to know what's going on in today. Nowhere that the Mother Mold is being created to create Nimrod. I think this issue all but confirmed that this is the Tenth Life, and this is their actions based off of what's going on in Powers of Ten. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I definitely think this is uh, the Tenth Life, and that brings me to one of my other big questions. And we touched upon this on the last show about the Apocalypse Factor. Yeah, there's nothing that really guarantees that she didn't go see Apocalypse first before Mm -hmm. she went and got Xavier and Magneto together. True. And I was just kind of thinking of, you know, there's probably things that she knows that if she reveals to Apocalypse in this timeline that doesn't remember her, that he will instantly know, okay, whatever she's saying is true and what she's telling me is that me and her, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay. And now we know all this shit. And so, you know, she goes to him and, you know, you were the fittest, you, you were the fittest of them all. You know, you were the last mutant alive uh, on earth at least. Cause you know, we don't know what happens after she yeah. dies in that life. Of course, Mars and all of them. So that that could play a major factor. I think mm-hmm. it is going to play a major factor, particularly with the the part at forty seven years that you know Magneto, Xavier, and her all have some sort of schism, and it would make sense that in the end, Apocalypse is the one that she you know ends up going with. Because again, I kind of mentioned the three you know the the three different kind of ways of xavier's you know peaceful coexistence magneto's uh you know dominance and superiority and then apocalypse just being the strongest so you know they could be the trifecta there obviously the three major uh philosophies and in the end she could have you know sided i think she does side with apocalypse as far as his philosophy of strongest fittest Mm-hmm. And she knows, well, in the end, he was the last one. So this is yeah. really, um, so she may be using Xavier and, and Magneto at this point to her and Apocalypse's own end. Fair point. So, I didn't even think about that. That's interesting. 
Yeah, I I mean, and you know, it's cool. We'll we'll get to see. And I think now that we're at the the halfway point uh, mm -hmm. of this, that we'll really get to see this develop more. Um, and so that brings me kind of to my next, I guess, discussion point I want to have about this series so far. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the the courtroom scene that I just went over with Emma Frost, you know, basically coming in and, and freeing a killer, someone that should, you know, rightfully so be uh, detained and locked away forever. Mm -hmm. um, so the manner at which, you know, the, the mutants are claiming to be gods over the humans, you know, some, some of a, a ruthless, more of a ruthless manner than, than we see the traditional X-Men. Yeah. So... You know, but now we know the reason they're doing that is because the knowledge they have that they're always going to be hunted by the humans and machines and the machines are going to always evolve in this way to where they're going to be fighting their, for their survival and lose. So obviously they're living life knowing that. And mm -hmm. so that's why they have that edge. But do you uh -huh. think they have the right to do that though? What do you... Fair point, honestly. <laughs> um... I... Does that defeat the X Men's? You know what the X Men are about. So you know we know, you know we know we're gonna face these troubles. So we're going to be more ruthless. I mean, if you look at what the X Men stand for, I say yes. They're absolutely going against what they always stood for, and proven pretty much in every life but the tenth. They were always trying to make peace with the humans, defend their Earth, prove that they're not killers over and over and over again. When things went good, somebody soured it. Somebody went after them, say yada, yada, yada. And so in this, it's like they're absolutely throwing it to the side. And like you said, and like mentioned in the very first issue, they see themselves as God. So it's not like... Yeah, we'll be with you. We may protect you, but you bow to us or you're shit out of luck. Like, it's just to the point where they're like, yeah, and every move you make, we have an idea what you're doing and you're done. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I mean, that's always been the truth of it. You know, the mutants versus humans. Like, I mean, it, you know, that's what it is. And if every mutant decided they were just going to focus on. Um, you know, dominating over the humans, you know, they, mm -hmm. they could easily do it. They got fucking people that can teleport and move yeah. metal and make mass amount of people do whatever mm -hmm. the hell they want, which is, you know, why it's one of the reasons why the X-Men are always so cool. Um, but again, they get that extra, you know, good guy points there for having that power yet not wielding it. And we're seeing mm -hmm. in this series now that, they they are wielding it because they believe and it's really i mean they I, I can't really argue they're wrong but they believe that you know what we're you know we're the underdogs here we're going to so we we have to fight with all with all of yeah. our might yeah it's and i really still wonder how well the other heroes if they end up doing any kind of crossover are going to take it like I still, this is to me easily, and maybe you can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong or tell me your opinion. This is easily setting up for another major arc between mutants and humans, mutants and other superheroes that are not born mutants. Because let's be honest, you got like Spider Man. Mm -hmm. Technically, he's a mutant. Like, let's be honest. Like, get down to it. His genetics were changed to a mutant form of a spider and he's even mutated into human spider before yeah like yep. but would somebody like him or captain america deal with this shit that's you know that is an interesting thought you would think that the avengers shield you know that they there would they would be like saying what the hell's going on here you know you can't just let the mutants take uh, you know, a murderer mm -hmm. um Again, we've seen the Fantastic Four intervene, but that's it. Yeah, and then, you know, Scott playing coy and like, oh, yeah. Well, well. I mean, I'm not completely caught up with the Avengers. I know that the War of the Realms just happened. Um, 
but you know, so I, I don't know how intact shield and the Avengers are. I know shield is kind of messed up from, you know, when it, the, the Hydra captain America mm-hmm. or captain Hy- Hydra, whatever. But so, remember, they're also part of the orchid. Yep. Shield is. Yeah. Shield. And, um, yeah. So it really, um, yeah, something's going to have to bring this all in line because mm-hmm. they're all in the same Marvel universe and, uh, you know, we don't see the absolute carnage stuff, you know, being rolled over or anything like that. So we will have to see, but we are here at the midway point, um, you know, just kind of a current state of where we're at. Just, you know, let me take a moment. Um, you know, I might cut this into a, a YouTube video itself, but so... Right now, with this House of X Powers of Ten event, we are six issues in, mm-hmm. and basically, you know, the current state affairs for the X Men is that Moira McTaggart is a mutant with reincarnation mm-hmm. powers who has learned over her lifetimes, uh, nine to be specific. The sixth, of course, we know nothing about, the other ones they touched on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, she has learned that the mutants are pretty much always going to be attacked and in a war against the machines and that Nimrod is basically their biggest threat and what they need to overcome in order to prevent the mutants being killed off by the humans and well machines really working for our humans working for machines that's just that's always going to happen in, in one way shape or form even if she takes out Bolivar Trask and anybody like the machines just start making themselves yep. and throughout these lives she's tried various strategies partnering with Xavier partnering with Magneto those failed and in her ninth life is when she decides to roll with Apocalypse and in this and it is in this timeline where you know mr sinister aids the fall of mutants uh by somehow becoming their leader developing these you know mutant uh hybrids called chimeras you know they they you meet the cardinal and rasputin and Mm -hmm. you know all the other mutants that are in that timeline they're working for apocalypse and basically apocalypse has four horsemen and moira who is known as akaba so he's like she's like you know female apocalypse she has her four horsemen which include the chimera mutants we meet rasputin and cardinal uh but either way they have this grand last stand because they basically come to the conclusion that they need to find out when and how nimrod comes online so that Moira can acquire that information and when she dies she will transfer that information to her 10th life where they can hopefully prevent Nimrod from happening and thus the extinction of mutants Mm -hmm. so that leads up to the 10th life where the mutants headed by Charles Xavier wearing a cerebral mask and never taking it off at this point and walking and walking (laughs) birthing his X-Men through, you know, inside of Krakoa, like pod people. Krakoa is where they live. It's a big Island. Uh, Cypher is a mutant that is along with Krakoa created a mutant language and anyone that goes to any mutant that goes to Krakoa instantly mm-hmm. learns this mutant language. Um, but we've learned, you know, why th- this is kind of strange because they of course know everything that Moira knows. She mm-hmm. came back and showed everything to Charles Xavier, you know, right as they met, they met up with Magneto, showed him and yeah, so they're now heading the X-Men, again, born like Urukai from Lord of the Rings, so that's strange. But we got Cyclops, we got Wolverine, Marvel Girl, you know, we have all the X-Men that we know. And they're the real ones, they're not like people portraying them. Right. I mean, they may be pod people, but yeah, they they're definitely seem to be uh, the real ones. 
And so armed with this future information, you know, they're now tasked with stopping Nimrod. And they find out about Orchis, which is this uh, network of humans, you know, scientific or scientific organizations like shield aim hammer sword yep. they've all come together because they realized that you know the mutants are coming back hydra not, too hydra yep hydra yeah a, you know aim hydra working with shield i mean these adversarial groups are now all working together because it's the humans versus the mutants and so mm -hmm. you know this orchis protocol has established that the hum the humans are running out of time because the mutants, you know, are not dying off, and so they're creating a mother mold out in space orbiting the sun. The problem is, is Moira's information has led Charles Xavier and the mutants to understand that Nimrod is preceded by a mother mold, uh -huh. and thus our major conflict is now happening midway through the series. Uh, the X-Men are going to assault this mother mold in space. And that's pretty much where our last issue heads off. So that is now uh, the setup. That's the conflict. Uh, we'll see how it resolves in the next issue. Um, but brilliant, brilliant stuff so far. Absolutely. All right. Well, as much as I love the X-Men... Uh, we've talked enough about them for tonight. It's going to uh, be a dream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we had some breaking news. So you're getting some breaking news here on uh, Volsker and D-Square Talk. Volsker, you, uh, what do you got for us here? Wow. Uh, when I saw this, I lost my fucking mind. So... I think it's pretty safe to say both you and I are pretty big Dragon Ball fans. Yes, although I'm a bit ashamed of myself because as big as of a fan as I am, I really have not watched the new Super stuff as much as I should have. I've seen all the movies, including Broly, mm -hmm. and those are fucking awesome. Uh, but yeah, just, I don't know, asterisk there, I guess. It's, I mean, you can definitely check it out i mean it's only taken funimation three fucking years to dub it um yeah, <laughs> yeah. speaking of funimation so um i was you know going through facey space today and a breaking <laughs> article from ign claiming leaked audio footage from voice actors from funimation and in this leaked audio we were having incestuous um type situations uh offensive joke or offensive jokes and homophobic slurs from the main cast um and this kind of stems off from one of their previous cast members who actually was in the broly movie that was fired from funimation the day or like the day after the dubbed um broly film went the theaters for sexual harassment hmm. so i took a gander and i was able to find some youtube streams today because this was like a huge topic mm -hmm. of the leaked footage or audio i can definitely say um it is definitely what they're making out to be is it is offensive I, I'll leave that to everybody else to infer. You, you, me, Dave Chappelle, um, you know, uh, George Carl, um, like comedy. It doesn't bother me, and I know it doesn't bother you. Mm -mm. Um, but to give you a little bit of an idea, um, what was said? It, the first footage was. Chi Chi moaning and orgasming, screaming Gohan's name. Yeah. Goku t saying that uh, Gohan is a fag and wears faggoty clothes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like, just picture this in the voice actors. Like, it's yeah. a straight up character, too. Um, what was the uh, Hercule or Mr. Satan? 
saying that he will never, basically, he'll never deprive his fans of his nice cock. (laughs) And then the last one is, like, the big one. And I was just like, holy shit, this goes on for, like, ten minutes. And it's a whole sexual audio drama of Kami and Mr. Popo. And Mr. Popo is told by Kami to rub him down with the mystical ointment. And Mr. Popo is basically portrayed as a slave. And you have Yamcha and Piccolo fighting over getting rubbed down next. Um, and then basically alluding to each other's areas and Yamcha screaming, he has to think of Balma, he can't handle this. And then it just goes on to a big whole, like, gay orgy alluded fest. It's off the wall, and <laughs> it, I, I can't do anything but laugh, because what sucks about this, and whether it's right or wrong, you know, jokes, serious, whatever... Somebody had taken this audio from them, whether the, I, I'm assuming they're probably warming up or just having a good time in between recordings and just goofing off and released this. And I believe from what I read that some of this is also going to the uh, lawsuit for Vic, the other one that was fired for after the Broly movie. So just to give this context. <laughs> Is this like old recording? Like what? When? When? Did, when was this done? Um, there's no dates as of right now. Um, the article did come out today saying that Rakita Law live stream um, stated that the whole reason that these were all presented and leaked out was because they violate Funimation's own workplace guidelines for harassment and homophobic slurs and things like that. And they were gathered 100% legally. Um, But there was, yeah, legally, how the hell did you get these? Um, You don't work for the company. So something, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, But this was a stem off of the firing. So I'm assuming they're relatively new. Or they could have been held on to for, you know, a year or two and now being released because of this. Like, I, I don't know. They could be you know, fuck, 90s, late 90s, early 2000s when they yeah. first started dubbing them. I actually probably be 2000s because Ocean dub was the first nut. Yeah. So 15, 20 years potentially, but they're high quality. So mm. I, I think they're pretty new. Well, that is, that, yeah, that's definitely stupid. Um, you know, stuff like that. And then, yeah, legally, how did you get it? But it happened. Yeah. You did it. You, you know, you just talked about how we can't get the shit dubbed on time. So, not you know, you're spending time uh, with homophobic shit. And, yeah, I, I don't know why anyone um, anyone would, would do shit like that. But particularly if you're of any fame, you know, whatsoever, you, you really... And and the, the the problem really is though is that you know mm-hmm. with anime comic books and you know manga stuff of that nature you know it does certainly have uh, a large following in the the l you know LGBT mm-hmm. community so yeah that's really uh, that's really not that's just really not smart and that's really disappointing and it sounds like it's yeah, going to result in, I guess, just new voices for the, the Dragon Ball characters, which is unfortunate because mm-hmm. that's, you know, a lot of, a lot of appeal. You know, I don't, I, you know, I don't particularly like just the sub stuff. I like the, the English dubbed. Yeah. Um, I, and I like the fact that they've been using the same voice actors for a couple of decades at this point. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sean Schemmel are... and Christopher Sabat. Yeah, yeah, and people are just um, gonna ruin something like that. Just uh, I, I don't know. I don't understand why that's fun. <laughs> I don't understand why that's uh, fun to spend time on uh, to be like that. And and I agree with you. And I mean, 
and that's maybe where we differ a little bit. I, I mean, I'm like comedy, like whatever. You just goof off and whatever. What, like I said, if it was serious, then that's a whole different story. If it was just goofing off, then you know, kind of goes in the whole society and just how things are, you know, nowadays. And even co- comedians are having to watch their jokes and watch their backs because people are getting offended a lot easier in today's society than, mm-hmm. you know, go back 20, 30 years. Um, but yeah, I'm, I don't know if this is going to result in new voice actors or, I mean, even worse, like I can see this potentially ruining a lot of Funimation's fame just in general. Yeah, it could. It, it, and it very well could. And that's, that's really, really unfortunate. And again, because so many of that community mm-hmm. are, are going to be offended by something like that. And I wonder if they, the big thing is I think they potentially stand, you know, losing just the Dragon Ball franchise in general. Because there was a little tidbit, which I didn't know. I don't know how true this is. I didn't fact check or anything. But they said that Christopher Sabat owns his own side company that is considered a competitor to Funimation. Mm. Now he works for Funimation, so let's just let that soak in for a moment. Yeah. Toei licensed the characters and franchise to Funimation, and then Funimation has an individual contract to license it to this competitor that then also has a contract over Funimation to this competitor has casting decisions over Funimation. So you have a third company that's nowhere in the main license having creative control hmm. of this franchise. Wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, neither did I. And I was like, oh shit. And, I, and I'm no lawyer or anything, but Toy can be like, wait, why, who the hell is this? I didn't yeah. license it to them, and now they're doing like, it can be huge. And I'm. It's just all started leaking out today, so I'm wondering what's going to happen over the next few days or few weeks. Yeah, it'll be interesting. We'll have to, to to keep an eye on it. It's um, yeah, just unfortunate to, uh, and th- just in this day and age, um, mm-hmm. you know that it's just uh, unfortunate. You know, something that I enjoy, and um, you know, some stupid decisions. All right, well, there you go. So uh, some uh, hot breaking news there on the House of D channel here. Uh, Volsker and me, of course, uh, with our talk show host, uh, or talk show here. All right, so last kind of subject of the night here. Um, Another comic that we've both been following. And I probably will, at this point, make sure that I follow all the major events here uh, for the channel. Um... You know, I'm not going to follow everything, maybe not balls deep like Volsker there, but, you know, I, I definitely think I can commit to just any major event, Avengers, mm-hmm. Spider-Man, otherwise. But, so here we are with Absolute Carnage, uh, Absolute Carnage number two uh, that I've read. I know you that you have read this as well as uh, some of the spinoffs here. So, mm-hmm. um, do you want to take us through uh, this issue here, or you want me to go ahead and... Uh, yeah, um, so like you mentioned, we have Absolute Carnage issue number two, um, and as I dubbed the biggest week for the actual story arc itself, because it also ties into Miles Morales, Venom 17, and the Lethal Protectors, which are the other three that I did kind of dive balls deep in, cause <laughs> being my first major huge story arc, um, yeah. other than Hox Pox, like, I wanted to fully get... You know what was going on, and so far I have not been disappointed. Nice. Um. Yeah. So as you can even just see with the uh, cover of number two, the regular, you you knew this was just going to continue from the last issue where we last left off. Basically, Spider Man and Venom just getting their ass kicked trying to save uh, Osborn, mm-hmm. uh, which we know Osborn is Osborn. But to his mind, he is uh, Cletus. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of where we left off the last issue. 
Um, right off the get-go, very first page, I mean, it basically just has a mutant deformed Venom and Osborne just basically rambling on about Cletus is dead, Osborne's dead, we're only one, we have, we're God, like, just going off about their goal of just getting their uh, God resurrected, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you basically have Venom and Spider-Man like, just like, shit, we, we need to get the hell out of here, we're beat, we can't do anything. Um, it kind of brings up a really interesting, we kind of talked about this, Venom develop symbiote wings to fly out of the prison or mental hospital because i believe this is a ravencroft so the mental host institution yeah um so that was just kind of interesting and they even play it off like spider-man's just like what the hell's going on i have no clue what you're doing right now <laughs> yeah yeah it's, uh yeah no spaces what is going on right now i hate all of it explanation mark <laughs> But yeah, it is a cool scene where yeah, Venom breaks him out of the prison, and then he yeah, like you said, grows like these big dragon wings and uh, flies him and Spidey out of there. Yeah, and um, and you got a, kind of a little bit of an interesting uh, like next um, next page where you're just talk, like you see Osborne and the Central um, Carnage, not one of the spawns, just kind of having a a conversation like it's no big deal like and osborne's even like what the fuck are you talking about and there's like there are more spiders where they came from osborne meaning that there's a whole lot more else they can focus on than just yep. these two definitely ominous um yeah and then i mean we have a little bit of a conversation here just they crash land and then this is where uh probably like you mentioned the biggest uh the biggest uh kind of in your face reveal is that um eddie brock's woman the mother of his child that he child still thinks is his brother is actually found to no longer have the codex it was passed on to their son who now they think he is basically going to be one of the next target number ones and weirdly enough this is all revealed uh by the maker yeah so a little cell phone conversation <laughs> yeah it's just really strange to me that you know ultimate reed richards basically from the ultimate universe mm -hmm. is like helping out spider-man and venom just weird yeah and yeah and it gets crazy because um and we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit one of the side issues um that he actually truly gets involved other than just conversation Okay. Um, but I just love the scene where Venom's just looking and it's just like, holy shit. And you just see carnage symbiotes just all over the streets and on top of the buildings running. And he's just like, yeah, I can see this now. Like the horde is just growing to a monstrosity level. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, yeah, and then we're kind of back down into this. Um, it says the spire on uh, miles under the streets of New York, which kind of ties in. You uh, find out in the other side issues that this is basically underneath the streets and connected to the Ravencroft institution, like d deep down underneath. Yeah, he's just got these tendrils like going everywhere from him now. It's really weird. Um. Yeah, and then I, I do like the uh, – and Osborne's, like, version just seems to just always be questioning and talking shit to Carnage, yeah. and he yeah. just does not like it. Um, so hey, you get some nice uh, interaction there where he basically just, like, threatens to rip the symbiote off and throws him to the ground. And he's just like, listen here, bitch. There's only one Carnage, and it's not you. Yeah, he's laying the smacketh down. Um, and then you just get a little throwback, and this kind of this issue is kind of interesting because. And do you have uh, the book with you? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this page is kind of ties into the current side issues that are also released, which is kind of weird because the reading order is this and then the side issues, but it kind of ties in like those side issues already happened. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so you have Deadpool, which uh, kind of stems from the Deadpool versus uh, Absolute Carnage from last week, which kind of very interested. <laughs> Why is he <laughs> holding microwave ovens? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. So um, on that issue, Spidey actually tells him, like, look, dude, I don't want anything to fucking do with you. You need to go get help. So he gives him a card to one of the therapists at Ravencroft, not Mm. knowing that it's been taken over yet. So it leads me to believe it actually took place before this issue number one. So Deadpool gets in there and he's goofing off, doing his typical shit, trying to talk to the receptionist who's basically dead sliced throat and he's just like oh sleeping i i've been there and he's just jolly walking through dressed up like rhino um which basically he has a, a hoodie as you can see he's yeah. wearing it it was actually spider-man's gift because it was <laughs> a fake birthday and he hired all the villains because he's like i don't know who you are so i just hired who knows you <laughs> um and <laughs> Basically, he just gets surrounded, and he's like, oh, shit, this is not where I parked my car. I need to go. (laughs) Oh, by the way, I was taking this somewhat serious. All of my weapons were left at home. (laughs) So he's just like, well, what does metal inside our microwaves do? And then that's basically what he does is he just starts blowing up the (laughs) institution to try to get them away from him. (laughs) Um, that was a short issue, but very, very funny, very Deadpoolish. Yeah. Um, a lot of slapstick. Uh, the middle one there, we have uh, Scream, which we kind of talked about a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago. Basically, it's just uh, the fifth uh, life symbiote. Then we have the separation anxiety on the far right. Basically, just about to just murder and take over this family just insane issue mm. literally just a horror movie yeah um then we have the uh throwback to the lethal protectors absolute carnage issue this week where misty knight is just getting slapped around from demo goblin which um, we find out is resurrected using the power inside her mechanical arm and snapping Shriek's neck and basically a pentagram. All right, makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> right. Crazy shit. And then we have the uh, Miles Morales and Scorpion right mm-hmm. there in the middle fighting. And it's basically, it looks like it's all this happening with all these symbiotes are feeding right into Carnage's mind. So he yeah. like knows what's going on. Yeah, hive mindish. Which then kind of carries us over into the second half of the issue where it actually focuses on that fight of uh, Scorpion and Miles Morales. Um, In his issue, they're actually basically – Miles Morales is trying to stop Scorpion from robbing the bank. They start duking it out, and then it goes right into here where they're just getting overpowered by Carnage symbiotes. Uh, basically, Scorpion is trying to run, but then he gets taken over. You have Miles Morales saying, no, we got to fight. I don't care if we're going to lose. They basically are about to lose, and then Venom comes saves the day. Um, and then basically at this point, you see kind of how Carnage extracts the Codex where he has Scorpion lifted by his neck and yeah. stabbed him into his spine and basically removes, um, or what we believe, moves part of his spine to actually get that codex. Yeah. Um, and then we have basically Scorpion basically saying he's paralyzed, he can't move. And then Miles Morales comes, saves the day, And gets captured. And that's basically where this issue cuts off. Don't know what's happening to him. He's getting surrounded, begging for help. And it looks like Venom and Scorpion are gone. Well, at least I know why then. Yeah, it doesn't exactly explain why Miles Morales and and Scorpion are in the same place. So... Um, that happens. Uh, 
Yeah, so that's some pretty crazy horror movie stuff. Uh, do you know how many issues this is supposed to be? Um, I believe it's only supposed to be five main, okay. and then like 29 total. Right, yeah, we did that. Um, so let's see, and I think it's basically <clears throat> one a month for Absolute Carnage. Like, what is it? August, or two August, two, one September two october and one so maybe six like it's really weird actually does this issue i think they actually have the uh the chart in the back page of this one or maybe not yeah. okay here we go so it is five absolute carnages we got Two in August, one in September, but September is filled with side ones where mm-hmm. we start getting um, Avengers involved, Symbiote Spider Man. So that sounds like it's going to be badass. We might get some uh, Black Suit Spider Man going on. Well, I might get that Avengers, the Avengers one. Ghost Rider gets involved. Um, and then we have October, we actually, we get f- number four, and then it wraps up in November with Absolute Carnage and Venom 20. Um, and to kind of mention what you were talking about, like, uh, you weren't quite sure why, uh, Miles Morales and Scorpion were in the same. Um, it also, that issue actually goes further than Absolute Carnage does. Mm. And we actually see the very last page of the Miles Morales, him carnageized form. Oh. So he has completely taken over. <clears throat> uh, I I love comic books, but I, I hate. <laughs> but I'm well, glad you... you're following it. I like the, the Avengers and the Immortal Hulk one have me yeah. kind of interested in. Well, you know where to grab them if you want to read them. <laughs> so, I mean, if you got the time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all priorities. I don't know, but I, I got to work on unlocking Colossus and Cyclops on Marvel uh, Ultimate Alliance 3. Oh, yeah, that's got some time there. Um, speaking of, so one last thing I did want to throw about this. Yeah, and I was going to ask you if you read the Ravencroft file here. A little bit, yeah, and it yeah. basically it, it portrays Osborne as just really fucked up. Yeah. Like he is out of his mind, like losing it. It's pretty insane. Um, yeah, it's. I wonder, like, is this maybe like, are we never going to get Osborne back because he doesn't have the symbiote anymore? Like, it's him. Like, I wonder what caused this issue. No, I think we are. Um, and I don't know why, but I just feel like the reason we're going to is because maybe they want to do, like, another Dark Avengers shit. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I don't know, that's just kind of, that's just kind of the character Norman Osborn is, like, mm-hmm. that's whole, like, all, that, that Dark Avengers stuff all happened because he just manipulated himself to be at the right place at the right time. Yeah. So that... The scroll queen, squeen, or, blah, the scroll queen, you know, she's about to take over Earth, blah, 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 and dude just, like, appears from behind her and just, boom, fucking caps her. <laughs> like, no hero, no superhero bullshit, nothing, just pow, dead. And even managed to manipulate it to where, basically, it was shown on live TV. Mm-hmm. And so, from that, he, can, he becomes president in the United States, and, yeah. yeah. So he's one of those characters that can come out of the woodwork and, you know, just like, bam, gotcha, I rule the world. Yeah. I mean, in terms of Spider-Man villains, he, next to Kingpin, I think he's probably one of the smartest. Yeah, well, and not to mention, he's the, he is the best Spider-Man villain. I mean, I love Venom. I'm really am not a fan of Spider-Man, which is, which is why I like Venom. <laughs> But when it comes to, like, just the most history, the most visceral, mm-hmm. the Joker to his Batman, 
It's it's the Green yeah. Goblin. You know, killed Gwen Stacy, like, you know, to date, other than Uncle Ben. No other, not that I know of, you know, no supervillain has ever, like, killed somebody that was Spider-Man's family or whatever like that. Um, and I actually, in the Ultimate Universe that led to Miles Morales, and it's been a while, I'm a little fuzzy on it, he actually killed Spider-Man himself. Right, right. Yeah, I forgot about that. Um, so, no, and I agree with you on that. Um, in Venom, I don't, like, I don't even know if you can really consider Venom a, a villain at this he, point. He, he's like, not He's not anymore. And, and, like, we're even going more off the deep end there because... And that's actually one cool thing, and I wanted to comment about that, so mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of circle around. That's one cool thing that I'm enjoying about just at least this absolute carnage... Mm -hmm. uh, issues is that you know it is Eddie Brock and he's and he's he has this son and it's like a father and son thing obviously you know yeah. have a father and have a son so that that's actually pretty cool mm -hmm. um that actually kind of helps me kind of keep interest here I mean other I mean it is cool otherwise um but it's just kind of cool to see that father and son dynamic and the fact hot take the fact that his son has the symbiote DNA, that totally means that either we're going to get to see him like, you know, like Carnage, or like another version of Venom. Yeah. I, I think that, I think we're going to get to see that. I think we're going to see like some sort of like kid Venom, you know, father and son versus Carnage. That's funny that you say that because – and I wonder if that may be kind of what they're alluding to in the Venom 17 issue this week, um, which, speaking of father and son, uh, I mentioned earlier with the maker, how he got mm -hmm. a little bit more involved. That issue basically is a direct sequel to Separation Anxiety where they're at the maker's laboratory. You have his son and you have Osborne's uh, was a grandchild, Peter's like – godson or whatever and they're bickering and all of a sudden you just see the four uh, life foundation symbiotes breaking in and attacking and the maker was not having a shit he's just like you want to mess with me let's do this just guns dropping blasting he, you actually get to see him use his uh um elastic power some and then he oh, just start you don't get, get to see that much yeah um and even the, it's funny too. There was a moment where he takes off his helmet, and the kids are like, "What the hell, your brain?" And he's like, "Oh, that must be scary." And he puts it back on, <laughs> um, and he's just, he just starts to get his ass kicked. So the kids run into a room. Uh, his son like grabs a gun. He's like, "I'm gonna figure out how to do this." And I don't remember the which one, but it's the yellow one. Is it? I believe it's Phage, maybe breaks in yeah it's phage he breaks in and he's about to kill these kids and then all of a sudden you just see his neck get snapped and it's a son that i never knew another spawn of venom um that basically came out of this and his name is sleeper where he basically looks like just all black venom with yellow chemical markings hmm. which now after reading his uh, kind of biography it kind of makes sense because uh, what, is, what we were talking about he has the uh, chemokinetic abilities hmm. so that's kind of where that like goopy bright neon green comes from yeah. but I wonder with the sun being protected by him if something happens to that host because it says here they don't know who's in the host at this point if the symbiote might go over onto him. Mm. So that way father and son, father yeah. and son. Right. Right. That would be cool. Yeah, good stuff. I'm glad I'm reading it. I'm glad I'm reading it. All right. Well, that will do it for us for this Volsker and D-Square talk. We will uh, see you again uh, check out our channels, of course, uh, Volsker 
has his comic reviews and he's uh, diving into his own stuff. And I'm going to continue, of course, with my Hox Pox uh, reviews and, you know, maybe spoilers when I, I feel appropriate or something is <laughs> major happen. Uh, you can uh, always, you know, see me on Twitter, of course, at the square 72 um, Go ahead and, um, you know, ask me a question. I'll definitely uh, like to answer that. And Volsker is, of course, at Volsker. I just have one final question before we sign off. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's um, your opinion, Volsker. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of uh, videos, uh, ideas for the channel here. What do you think would, would be better? Just, you know, off the top of your head. Okay. Top five fastball specials. You, you, you know what a fastball special in, in X-Men comic books is, right? Um, You'll have to enlighten me. Okay, gotcha. So basically that is a, a move where Colossus throws Wolverine. Uh, at enemies or, or whatever, and it's the oh the, yeah he the fast did that, that horrible horrible X three yes yes he did actually, which is one of the only cool things about that movie, or a video that basically helps people get into comics like you know how they should go about doing it or what they could do to make it easier you, know, something you might. Like that. <laughs> That's uh, that's funny. You might call me a little bias on this. I, you know, I love Colossus, love Wolverine, just the whole yeah. premise around that's awesome. But being a novice reader myself, and looking to you and us having conversations that what if stemmed years, I've brought this idea. You know, where do I jump in? Where do I jump in for years? Mm -hmm. And it's just happened to be the you know balls deep. I'm doing it, and it's perfect timing with uh, uh, oh, House of Ten and Powers in Ten. Yeah. I think that would be perfect because in today's day and age, you know, comics are everywhere. See what they're doing in theaters, cartoons. I think it would just be a really good starting point or an idea of a starting point for mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of people out there. Okay. Um, I'm trying to get Haley into it. I'm sure you try to get Rourke into it. I didn't he used to get like the Guardians and uh, Rocket comics back in, a couple years ago. Yeah, he goes in and out of things, so uh, it just seems the way he is. One minute he's a BMX biker, and next minute he's all about Xbox, <laughs> and then it's, oh, I'm not going to be playing Xbox that much, so, you know, it is whatever. Believe me, we, we used to go all in, like, when he likes shit, and then, yeah, we, yeah. we learn, like, yeah, he just fucking drops it, so. Yeah, I'm learning that myself with, uh... <laughs> Haley and uh, her LOL dolls and all that shit. Yep. Parenting tip here on the uh, Volsker and D-Square <laughs> talk. Dabble a little bit. Just don't right. jump right in. Yeah, exactly. Dabble a little. Don't jump in. Or else you're going to spend a fuckload of money and have hundreds of monster trucks that no one gives a shit about anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's at least a positive because since Haley's the second oldest, um, like a lot of her girly shits pass to Brooklyn or your little girl, so at least get some extra use out of it. Yeah, I know, but yeah, I got the only boy, so it just uh, sits. <laughs> All right, though, but yeah, sounds like okay. Well, I should work on that video at some point. Um, yeah, Eric at Comics Argo, of course. Uh, great owner there good guy you know he thought that would Absolutely. make a good one too so i uh i will deliver at some point here all right everyone will have a good night and uh, please like and subscribe hit the notification to make sure you hit all the videos here uh get us on twitter get at us on twitter and um we'll see you soon peace